and to peak and uh, to this particular challenge. Um, <clears throat> what I wanted to say is, um, we have, I've talked to someone today and we had this uh, this this three way question that I think happens constantly all the time when we ask ourselves, is this it? And we're asking ourselves from the perspective of we're thinking that to ourselves, is this all my life has to offer me? And um, <clears throat> I think it's a, a profound question. I think it's an important question. And I know I first asked myself that question when I was 18 years of age. And I'll explain that a little bit later why, why I done that. But um, <clears throat> I think it's important at this point to, to stipulate that it'll happen at various points in your life. It won't just happen at 18. It might not happen at 18. It might be 25, maybe 30. You may be 40, 50, 60 and still asking yourself that question. And I think it's important for us because it gives us a chance to reflect where we are in life and whether this life has had true meaning or purpose for us. The objective of this particular webinar is it's, is so that you can find your flow and accept change in your life because there's an inevitability that change comes to us constantly all the time i think never more so as it is now at this moment in time when you think about all the things that are happening to us in particular when you look at the cost of living crisis the way that's affected us it's the way it's affected business um, cost of food, cost of petrol, cost of energy. Everything forces us uh, to uh, to struggle, but not only does it force us to struggle, it makes us rethink things and some things we have to change. And uh, change at times cannot be easy. And I think we would all accept, especially those of us who've had kids, that life, life can be a struggle at times. And it was Bruce Lee who had this wonderful quote when he said, pray not for an easy life, but pray for the strength to endure. Just a minute, somebody else, just excuse me. Pray for the strength to endure a, to endure, uh, to have the strength to endure, uh, to endure a, a struggle. And I think that's so important. That really is what our life is about. We have to accept that there's going to be a certain amount of struggle to us. And uh, that being the case is we have to prepare ourselves. And that was one of the things that really interested me about change and flow. And that is because flow, I found, has really helped me uh, not only to change many things in my life, uh, whether that was in the sport, my sporting background, which I'll explain a little bit in a minute, but also with, within my business, because I train my mind for constant change and for constant improvement. What I'd like to start with, though, is what is flow? <clears throat> and Joyce Grenfell, who was a 1950s actress, um, <clears throat> mainly from the source of black and white, St. Trinian's movies for those for those that, that that can remember or recall those kind of movies. She had a wonderful saying, and her saying would be, "There's no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy." And for me, that is a, is exactly what flow is about. It is about finding joy in what you do, and I think that's the first thing that we have to recognise with flow that, and for you to find your flow you have to feel passionate about what it is that you're doing and that in itself can be hard work because we can often start things they can end up being a bit of a struggle and sometimes when life is a bit of a struggle we give up too easily but to find flow you have to be determined committed disciplined and dedicated Without those qualities, you will not find flow. I remember, or I recall, I want to tell you about uh, what flow feels like. And I think that's, that's really important, but intrinsically looking at the way flow feels and someone externally looking at the way, the way flow feels as well. So intrinsically, when you experience flow, 
you feel a joy from what it is you're doing. You do not need or you do not require from anybody else uh, 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 any type of uh, um, comment with regards to the way you're performing. You're doing it for yourself. What it is that you're doing is very much uh, a reward in itself. And I think that's important to understand. So you you don't embark in trying to achieve flow in your life by, by saying to yourself, oh, what I would like to do is uh, I want more money or I'd like a bigger house or because that's putting things in, in the way. What you're doing for, to achieve flow is you're doing intrinsically for yourself. And externally, people will often be drawn to you. And they'll be drawn to you because they'll recognize that what you're doing is very complex, but you perform it in such a way that is very simplistic. And that is to be in flow, able to do something with such expertise, such mastery that you make it look easy. And I think that's what draws people in externally. They, you draw them into your orbit because of your ability with what you're able, what you're what you're able to perform and do. Now, the type of skills that we may be talking about, there, there, are, there are obvious ones such as musicians, uh, um, actors, maybe sports personality. You may be able to think of some sports personalities yourself or, or an artist. So, uh, some type of skill has been practiced over and over again, which helps somebody perform in such a way that you can't help be drawn to it. If you are doing something, you have a lifestyle and you say to yourself, well, how can I reach? How can I take hold of flow and how can I help? How can that help me in where I am at this moment in time? So. Um, it's not so important. To able to facilitate flow in with what you're doing initially in your work or in your everyday life, but you need to find a way to engage flow. So you start, you have to, there's a starting point in which you have to, um, in which you have to practice. There's something you need to engage with. And that's what I, I want to talk to you about. Some of you may recall the 2003 uh, Rugby World Cup with Johnny Wilkinson. And um, Johnny Wilkinson, if you if you recall, had had to take the final uh, kick to win the World Cup, and had he missed, we wouldn't have won. We wouldn't have won. It would have gone to the other team. But as it was, he he performed and executed his technique in an exceptional way, and he um, and and he scored, and we won the World Cup, which was uh, which, which was obviously terrific. But what I wanted to uh, was to look at is what he did, because that comes from practice. He obviously had to um, he obviously had to look at his balance, his gait, his speed, his strength, and he was making adjustments of all these things as he was doing them. And it was these small adjustments to impact to make sure that he was improving upon himself, that he was able to make them at such a critical point in time. So he was making changes in real time. And I think for me, that's the point. That's a real strong point. And that's how when we educate, when we train our body to make decisions on the move, and sometimes they're only very, very, very small decisions, but they have big, big impact. So take a look at the, the final rub, rugby kick uh, by Johnny Wilkinson. Had he kicked too hard? Had he kicked through the ball perhaps too long? Perhaps he took one stride too long? Then he possibly would have missed. But he was so accomplished in what he did. He was so practiced in what he did that he knew how to temper what it was that he needed to do, the right power to execute the technique so the ball went over uh, the, the post in that particular game. And that comes from commitment. That comes from constant 
practice. And that's exactly what I want to talk to you about now is routines and practice, because we all have routines and practice in our everyday life. Take, for example, that you wake up in the morning and you will all have a routine that you follow. Most of us will fall on some type of autopilot. And what that will mean is that you will probably wake up in the morning, you probably jump in the shower. After you've been in the shower, you may clean your teeth, brush your hair, have a cup of hot coffee, jump in the car or get on the train and you make your way to work. And often would be the case that when you get there, you suddenly ask yourself, well, how did I get here? How is it that I have turned up where I am at this moment in time? And that's because you have a routine. All of us have a routine that we follow. But with flow, the difference is, with flow, the difference is this, that you're, what you're willing to do is that you're willing to commit to improve the routine or the pattern that you follow. And it becomes a way of life. So let me explain to you exactly what I mean. Some of you will be aware that I had a sporting background up to the age of 25. And um, I had learned from all my training and what I did. And, and just to, uh, to to put it in perspective, uh, the sport I was doing was Thai kickboxing. I had 34 fights uh, and I was two times British champion. And my last fight was in Miami in 1988. Now, I'm saying all this to you to understand the possibilities of where something and this approach can take you from where you are today, perhaps where you're going to be, not necessarily being a British champion or a European champion in, in any particular sport, but about the improvement that it can bring to your life. And I want to explain to you exactly what I did, and then I'd like to explain to you why I did it. When I was training, I had this realization that I, I, wanted, I wanted to improve, I wanted to get better. So the question is, how do we improve? Well, we take a routine, for me, it may have been a combination. And once we've got a combination, we start to practice it, we can become better and better at it, more accomplished in its execution and in its delivery. And once you're performing this in this particular way, you have to have the ability then to unpack it. And what I mean by that, you may take, you may look at your body movement and you may then say to yourself, OK, well, I'll take this little element out because I believe I can improve that maybe by turning in a, in a slightly different way. But I may adjust it and the adjustment may be small. But once I make the adjustments, the impact can be absolutely massive. And that's the important thing is that to make to bring into your the way you move an additional element. So into your routine, you add an additional element or you take an element away. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to improve it all the time. Now, that can be really hard to do because sometimes there's an inevitability that you will not. That you will not uh, get the improvement that you're seeking. And that's when it becomes really difficult because you have to be determined, you have to be disciplined and you have to be dedicated if you want to make those improvements. And for me, I kept with it and I kept doing it. I would add a little element to it or I'd take a small little element away with a view to try and improve the overall thing that I was doing. And this is something we can do in our everyday life. Whatever routine you're following, I'm saying that you can use this practice to improve what you do. So if there's something in which you want to, you feel passionate about, makes you feel joyful inside, you feel like you can dedicate yourself to do it, then you've got a situation whereby now you can use this model of saying to yourself, OK, I've done it, I can perform it to a fairly good standard. How am I going to improve it? I can add something to it, change something within it, or take something out. And once you change something out, once you change this, uh, take this element out, then you start practicing and you're trying to do it all over again until you feel 
you really have began to improve. I know from my point of my from my perspective, when I did this, that at times I hit a plateau and I couldn't get beyond that plateau. And it took months and months of work. And sometimes it's frustrating to you as an individual. Remember what Bruce Lee said. Pray not for an easy life, but pray for the strength to endure a strong life or to be strong enough to endure a, a, a hard life. And that's what you need. You need that strength and you need that commitment to turn that corner, to move yourself forward. And that's exactly what I did. And that's how I made the improvements. But when I hit this plateau, and that means that you don't feel as if you're improving and it can be really frustrating. <clears throat> and you have to find it. You, do, you, you can be doing lots and lots of adjustments, but you still don't find that key that sort of unlocks the door. And this can go on for, for a considerable amount of time when you're frustrated and hitting this plateau. So you shouldn't uh, look upon yourself and you shouldn't remonstrate or be too hard on yourself if you find yourself that you find it really difficult to get beyond this plateau because when the breakthrough moment comes when eventually that you are able to step through and break through that plateau you will suddenly find that your ability comes on tenfold and that's exactly what i found and that really gave me at that point in time a lot of confidence. I felt courageous in as much as I was leaving my comfort zone and I was trying something differently. That makes you courageous. And you have to think about that perspective to your lives. What I'm doing by changing that element, I'm doing it on the move. The idea is so I respond without having to consciously think. But I'm the only way thing I'm really thinking about is how am I going to improve? That's that's it. That's the only thought that I have. But besides that, my body is just responding. But and when it do, when it does respond, when it does respond, you have this situation whereby you have this situation whereby you're doing it automatically. You, you do the subconscious mind is just taking over the full routine, like the situation where you went from starting out to getting up in the morning and going to work. The only difference and the significant difference here is that I'm seeking to improve what I'm doing. And you have to think about the 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 outcomes from from a leadership perspective from you when you're even running your business, because what I'm talking about is developing the self. I'm trying to improve myself by making these small adjustments constantly on the move, which means that I'm not stopping to recalibrate where I'm up to. I'm move, uh, as I'm on the move, I am um, I am making decisions. And, and I'm learning now in life to make quick decisions and to move on. And if it's not worked out the way I wanted to, I'm taking action to take it out quickly, the, the, the element that I added to and put them back in. That means all of a sudden I'm a decision maker. That's a, that's a massive thing in business. And that's what this does. By learning that autopilot in your life is awakening something in you that we have certainly began to forget. And what I mean by that is, um, what I mean by forgetting is, um, <clears throat> is that we live such sedentary lives here in the 21st century. Well, often as we are doing now, sat in front of a computer screen. And then when we finished sat in front of a computer screen, we come home. And when we come home, we're either on Netflix or we're messing about with our mobile phone. So we're just sat down again and we're not using the body in which to help us to move forward in our life. We must. One of the things that I think sort of really uh, agitates me is when I hear people talk about mindset as, as if there's some type of dichotomy between the mind and the body. You know, you can only have a strong mindset, which what flow is giving you through the elements of practice that I'm telling you to do. You can only have a strong mindset when the body's been conditioned. How can you understand resilience? How can you understand persistence if you haven't been willing to stress your body? 
there's going to be no learning outcome. And of course, when you are stressed, you also become, when you're physically stressed, you become mentally stressed. How so? Because your breathing obviously becomes shallow and then all your, your lungs, your heart, your vital organs, the blood flows there and there's less blood to your brain. How can you make, when you're under pressure, good decisions? What flow gives you the ability to do is that make good decisions, quick decisions whilst you're on the move and being able to evaluate it fast while you're on the move. And if it's not working, then to be able to drop it and to put something in its place whilst you're on the move. And this becomes your constant routine. But you have to be, and this is really, really important, you have to, you have to feel so passionate about what it is that you do. Just like Joyce Grenfell said in her saying, there's no such thing as the pursuit of happiness, but there is the discovery of joy. And you have to define flow. You have to find your joy in what you do. <clears throat> I want to take you back to 1980, and I appreciate a lot of you won't remember Liverpool in 1980. Some of you may not even know Liverpool. Uh, <clears throat> But how can I explain Liverpool 1980? For, for those who that know Liverpool will know about the Toxted riots that happened in 1981. But Liverpool was uh, a city that was in decline. Um, and at the end of the 70s and early 80s, me and my brother and a gang of lads, we would be travelling down to London to compete in London. And we would travel from... Liverpool Lime Street to London, Euston on a train. And uh, what most people won't appreciate is this, that there was first, second and third class on those trains. And it was the time it took, it only takes two and a half hours now. It took six and a half hours, six and a half hours from Liverpool Lime Street to London, Euston. That's one hell of a journey, six and a half hours. And... Uh, because the train would be rattling forwards and backwards. And of course, at the end, when we got off, we, we had to compete. After six and a half hours, we'd be up early to catch the six o'clock train, arrive in London about 12.30. And once we're in London, we would then be looking for when we, where we were going to compete. And my very first time at 17 years of age in London, I didn't get to stay in London very long, but I seen something that I'd never seen in my life. And, and it, what it did, what it did for me, it made me want to change something in my life. It was a catalyst of change. It's so strong that I can recall something that happened nearly uh, 42, 43 years ago. And what it was is that as I came up from, from the underground to where we were going to compete, and I seen London for the first time, was the fact that the, all the restaurants the pubs, the bars, you never had gin bars, then it was wine bars, but they were full. And people were dressed to the lines. I'd never seen anything like it in my life, certainly not seen it in Liverpool. And I couldn't get how old, how could these people, how could these people afford to do it? I couldn't afford to do it at 17, to be hanging around in the bar, dressed to the lines, in all the latest gear. I couldn't do that. And I looked at these people and I was really stunned. And there was no way you would have seen those crowds of people in restaurants trying to get in, queuing up to try and get in there during the daytime in Liverpool. But that's when people talk about the North and South Divide, that's exactly what happened when I see in London. And I made a decision then and then, and this is really, really important. Very, very important. I made the decision that I wanted to change something in my life. And I realised if I didn't change it, I would be saying that to myself, is this it? Is this it with my life? Is this what my life is going to be for me? And it was a point by which I then decided that I needed to change something. I needed to change the way I was living. And how was I going to do that? How was I going to do that change? And the only way I could do the change was becoming good at something, becoming good at something and then being willing to make a commitment as I've done it. So I had to commit something. I had to be determined. I had to be disciplined. I made that decision 
there and there that I was going to do those things. And the decision I made, the only way out I could see at that point in time was becoming good in the tie and the kickboxing. And that's exactly what I did. I committed to my training. And I started really, started to win fights. And as I said to you earlier, once you start to do this and you go on through it, the sport's irrelevant. The sport has got nothing to do with it. Winning or losing has got nothing to do with it. The point being here is the joy that I was experiencing because as I was training and I broke through this path, this, this plateau that I was hitting, as I was training, I became more confident in me. I came become more confident in my ability. And because of that, I was becoming more courageous. And every time I would travel down to London to fight, there was a trainer down there called Dave Lee. You could probably look him up. Lee spelled L-E-A. He died earlier this year. Uh, but he used to train all the stars. So he used to get the people who sort of want to do kickboxing in London. You get a lot of, uh, so for instance, uh, uh, sort of models you know, often associate with boxing. You get EastEnders, the, the, uh, that, that would be actresses, actors from EastEnders were doing it. And some were, some uh, the pop groups used to train at this guy's. This guy's gym. And uh, every time I got out of having a fight, because of my performance, uh, Sugs from Madness used to call me over. I said, John, 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 let me buy you a drink. And I'd be invited into his private area. And, and he, he would buy me a drink. We'd sit down and have a drink. And I was looking at this guy, because he was on top of the pops and everything. And I just kept saying to myself, what does he want to know with me? What does he want to do with me? Who am I, Tim? He's the guy who's on TV, after all. And I'm just a guy that's turning up from a Liverpool area to go and box. What does he want to do with me? And I had this real sort of internal conflict with myself with regards to what was going on at that point in time. But I've since then come to realise what he identified in me was, was the performance was the performance and he was drawn in to my orbit because he felt I was giving everything that I had to give at that moment in time. And he could see me for when I was turning up. He could see the improvements I was making, even if I didn't always win. He could see the improvements that I that I was making. Because I don't want to confuse the two. I don't want you to go away thinking that flow means to win because it doesn't. And uh, just to confirm that, I want to tell you about uh, before I talk talking about business and change and making decisions and the way flow can really help you move forward. I want to tell you about um, two two fights that I had and the, and the first one was because of the confidence I had, and that was that I won the British title at nineteen years of age, which was very very young, very young and um, probably too young to appreciate it. And in our camp, our club, I was the only one that, that was doing it at that moment in time. And what happened, I'd seen this lad defend this title. He did five, five rounds, and uh, which is typical of kickboxing and uh, tie boxing. And uh, I remember saying to my brother, I can beat that guy. Now, it wasn't like me. You know, you just put me in another arena and made me play for the greatest football. I'm absolutely awful when it comes to playing golf. I'm, I'm terrible. I can't play golf at all. You know, I'd be the worst four ball person to invite me in to ask me to play golf because I'd slow that game down so much. But in that sport I did, I felt passionate about it. And my passion, I can tell you now, it was not because I felt, oh, aren't I great? Oh, I can do this. I tell you what made me go, and I still feel this way today, was the control I could have over my body. And I realised I was doing things, whether it was spinning kicks, jumping kicks, that other people couldn't do. And, and, and it was that control over my body that gave me my intrinsic value. And the added bonus was that if I had a win or something like that, that um, I was beginning to make a name for myself to such a degree that in this fight in London, I challenged this guy one Christmas, Christmas 1982. I challenged this guy. And then a few months later, in April 1983, the fight, I was 19 years of age. 
and uh, the fight the fight went ahead and, and I won it after five rounds and fortunately I've still got that on so that's on my YouTube account you can see that so that's that's a fight I won but what the point when I'm telling you about this is this not because I'm wrong because that's I'm going to tell you about one I've lost in a minute because the winning and the losing is irrelevant what's important is this is that the way I had to keep going at it chewing at it keeping at the bit to try and find improvements in what I was doing that is the important thing that's the important thing and it's that commitment and desire that really takes you to flow and unless you feel passionate about what you're doing you will not experience it but feeling passionate about it and then putting the work into it you're really on your way and you will begin to experience it and then <clears throat> I want to tell you about another guy I fought. There was a guy, there used to be a nightclub in Liverpool called Ross's. It was in uh, St. John's Precinct. <laughs> Probably not there now. But uh, one of the guys I, I boxed, five threes in uh, in Liverpool, 1985, was uh, Oliver Harrison. And you'll probably know Oliver Harrison. And, and, and I say that because Oliver Harrison was the... Um, was the boxing trainer to Amir Khan, the professional boxing, world, world boxing champion. So he was his trainer, and certainly Oliver has, uh, has passed away. Um, and uh, Oliver was the British champion in um, Thai boxing, and I was the British champion in kick kickboxing, and we, we were going to have this fight. And it was Thai boxing, so it was me, I was trying to take his Thai boxing title off him. And uh, I was I was the type of fighter that used to close down really fast. Um, Oliver wasn't. He had he was a marvelous technician, and uh, his timing was superb. We started opening up in the in the uh, in the first round, and he caught me with the right round. I was kicked to the eye, and my eye came up, and I took an eight count. And then uh, in the second, third, and fourth round, I took him down, Oliver down with leg kicks, and he went down. And then in the fifth round, Oliver did exactly the same thing over again. He caught me again. And I went down and my eye completely closed and I had about 30 seconds of the fifth round to go. Uh, and the referee was, it was the only time I uh, suffered a technical knockout and the referee was going to stop the fight. And I remember saying to my brother, oh, just slip my eye so it would take the blood out of my eye. And my mum came up shouting and said, don't slice his eye, don't slice his eye. So that was the sort of end of that particular fight. But what, what was important here is this. That's relevant to flow now. Is what Oliver said to me afterwards. He came up to me, threw his arms around me, and he said, never again, never again. And what I took that to me now, then, at that moment in time, was this. What he was saying is that we both brought, brought our talents to bear. We both tried our very, very best. We both really trained for this fight. And it could have gone on anyway. Well, he had the skill that overcome that on that particular night. And he recognised he had a hard fight. And I also said to him, yeah, never again. Definitely never, never again. But the point of being here is this. He recognised the talents that were brought to bear. And that is so important because it goes both, both, goes back to what I was saying earlier, that people are drawn to your orbit by the complexity of what you perform, but you make it look so simplistic. So, so in essence, in essence, to find your flow, to find your flow, you need to find something that you really feel passionate for, and that can be hard to do. And my only recommendation to you would be this, is try lots of different things until you find your passion. But it's important that you do it because you, with what, you're, what you do, your heart has to sing. You have to feel really comfortable about what you're doing. And I think as well, there has to be an element of physicality about it. Now, I don't mean it has to be so stressful that you can't breathe. But I do believe you have to have that. And I'm going to give you um, a couple of reasons why I think it's so important. And especially when it comes to 
finding flow and re-engaging with yourself to reawaken a process that we've forgotten about because we live such sedentary lives. The obvious one I've just spoken about earlier was when the child's walking and learning to walk. No one walks up to that child with a diagram or a schematic and explaining how to do it. The child stands, its gait, its stride, the way it holds its head, balance, and they try and move forward. And as they try and move forward, they fall. But the body is telling the mind exactly what things it needs to do to improve, to move a little bit further forward. The child wants to stand up to walk because she or he has a desire in which to do that. And that's very important, the desire, the desire is there. And then the correcting on the move, and it's knowing that the, it's knowing that the body is informing the mind how to do these small little adjustments that it's necessary. Because there's no dichotomy between mind and body. For me, no dichotomy at all. It's all yin and yang. You're one and the same. You need to learn to move. You can't, you can't improve one without doing the other. So you may as well just accept it and move forward and try and take them both, both together. I've often seen two examples I'll give, which you will be aware of is, uh, for instance, when you've tried to, or someone's asked you for a mobile number. And for the life of you, as they're asking you for this mobile number, you're trying to think of a way to key it in. The number just won't come. You know it starts with 07, but the rest of it won't come. And then you pick up your phone, and then your fingers just move to the digits. Although you can't recall the number, you're now speaking to the person on the other end of the phone because your body knew what to do. And that's exactly what it is when we have a repetition or a pattern that we use to help us move ourselves forward. And the other one we see time and time again is when someone is, um, maybe someone's challenged or um, you, you can see them upset on the phone, maybe in a bit of an argument. And, and, and when they're on the arguments on the phone, what do they do? They pace up and down, forwards and backwards, continually all the time. So they're using the body. Why are they using the body? Because it helps them think better and clearer. As they move, they can think clearer. And that's exactly why we do it. And for me, I realised this in this dichotomy in the world that we're living, that people have forgotten how to use the butt of the body to remind them that how to be resilient, to remind them how to be, uh, to be persistent, and to, to, just to, to generally in, in improve their mobility and fitness. It becomes such, uh, such an important aspect to move both together in order to help you find your flow for the reasons that I've that I've stated, and especially if you're in business, because when you're in business, what you'll want to do is to have the ability to make decisions on the move. And the, the pattern, the, the pattern or the way you organize yourself to make those decisions on the move and get used to building the decision making muscle by constantly making decisions on the move is by when you're performing your pattern or routine, that you're adding those elements to it. But you become so practiced at it that in the end, it's not a case of stopping to have to consciously think about it. You're just able to do it. And the fact of the matter is, you've all done it before. Because if I asked you on here, how many of you can ride a bike? You'd all say, yeah, of course I can ride a bike. But there was a time you couldn't do it. And what you had to do is that your parents had to sit you on the bike, probably hold the seat behind you and got you just to pedal forward and not to turn the uh, handlebars, but just to cycle forward. And that's exactly what you did. You just cycled forward. After you practice a bit, you went a little bit further. And once you're perhaps you were happy with it, how far you were going, you were then taught how to turn the handlebars. Initially, you probably turned them too severely and you, you fell off the bike. After a while, you were able to turn the wheel. You turned, you were cycling, moving, braking, and you were able to do it. 
And then you could become more advanced through the practice like you did. And you would then look at, you'd be able then to look at cars coming at you, pedestrians crossing the roads, cars behind you had a sense of awareness. You didn't have to stop the bike to evaluate it. You were making decisions on the move. And how were you able to do that? Because you became so practiced in what you were doing. So my route to flow is this, is that you have to be able to practice. And if you're in a situation whereby you're saying to yourself, well, I can't think of it now within my place of work or with what, I, with what I'm doing, how can I find flow? That's exactly why I've created the flow learning cycle. And the flow learning cycle, or sometimes called the REF model, gives you the model how to find flow through non-intuitive movement, simultaneous of all limbs all at the same time. And the reason why I've done this is not because it's physically challenging. It's not. I've done it this way. Because what it makes you, makes you do, it mentally challenges you. You're moving your body for mobility, not in a physical way. You are, but you are moving your body. And that's the non-intuitive movement. Simultaneously of all limbs. And once you learn to move like this, you have to master it. And once you master it, in other words, you're not stopping to think about how I move my legs with my arms to move forward. Once you're able to do that, you're reacquainting yourself with a learning pattern that we've long forgotten. Once we've got you there, then you're then able, you're in the process of bringing your yin, your yang together, where you're able to move your body and find flow on what you're doing you've you've got the building blocks to find flow because you've reawakened the process that you haven't done before or you've you've long forgotten because it's been that long since you've had to do something or you know not just sitting in front of computers and then sit up come home and watch netflix you're actually doing something constructive to improve yourself to develop yourself that eventually will make you more confident because you become more competent, you'll be more courageous and more willing to take more chances because, and these are chances that you're evaluating because you've learned to do it on the move. No one stopped you, like when you began to ride your bike, no one stopped you from doing it. We've just reawakened that process. And once we've got you there and we've reawakened that process within you so you can discover the flow within you, then you can seriously start to look at what it is that you want to do, how you feel more fulfilled in your life. You can really begin to look at that process. <clears throat> There's going to be a time during that process whereby you may become a little bored or even frustrated because you're committed and because you have to practice. And there are times, there are times when I feel like oh, I just can't be bothered. But I know in those times when I feel, and as old as I am now, when I feel that way, that that's the very time that I really need to do it. Or when I'm looking for excuse, I might have a bit of a headache or, or I don't feel 100%. I'll still go and work out. I'll still do what I'm used to doing. And that's because... I'll have to come back and I'll feel better within myself for having done it. And that is, that is, that is strengthening your mindset. It's supporting your mindset. It's so important to accept the struggles in your, your life. So it's so easy to say, no, I'm not going to step through that. Or no, I'm not going to do it. And we're back into this situation where everything is so convenient for us. We're coming home watching Netflix because it's there. I don't have to go to pictures. I can phone up Just Eat and get them to deliver a meal for me because it's simple. It's convenient. But the trouble of it is life's not convenient. And the mindset you're imposing upon yourself by every time that you do that will not be a mindset that develops you and pushes you and forces you to go forward. Well, finding your flow does 
is it challenges that kind of mindset. It challenges you to want to improve. It challenges you to think about how am I going to improve my daily routine? And it means that you can start tomorrow because you can look at your routine tomorrow morning and say, this is what I do in a routine. How am I going to improve it? You can do that yourself and start looking for something in which it makes you think and not doing it just for convenience in itself. So really that's exactly at this point in time what I wanted to go through with you with regards to finding flow. It's just, just to recap is this, you need to find something that makes you intrinsically happy. That is so, so important important if you're not intrinsically happy with what you're doing if you're still asking yourself the question is this it is this my life if you're asking yourself those questions it means you need to change something in your life and you know you know it because something is telling you inside i need to change something in my life to make these changes is going to take commitment. And I think the roadmap to do is the thing that unlocks it, the thing that will help you with this is my flow learning cycle. It will help you move. It will help you develop your challenges and it will help you improve upon what you're doing now on a daily basis. And as I said, you can start. You can start that. You can start that now. Tomorrow, what I intend to do tomorrow is I want to look deeper into flow and into finding flow within your way and talk about this decision making and the benefits of flow in, in your way and the benefits of being able to make decisions. Because if we can't make a decision, it's often because we're full of fear. And fear removes options from the table. If you're full of fear, you won't move forward because what you will do, the fear will override any decision that you have to take. And often this will fall and we will be looking for a safety net that can help us. So. Uh, being able to step out. How do you step out when you become more confident? You become more confident in you, more confident in your ability. That has to be the key. And that's going to take commitment. And I can't give that to you. I can only tell you that the way that you can achieve it is by committing to something, dedicating yourself to something and to constantly seeking improvement. And I found that seep through in everything that I've done. And even when I was in my business life, that seeped through in everything that I wanted that I've done. And um, what I intend to do tomorrow is uh, explain to you how in business that's that's um, going to actually happen for me, that I found myself in flow with what I was doing and how I found making decisions so much easier. Because I knew I had the capacity to add an element to it. And if it went slightly wrong to take that element out and not feel too harsh myself because I'd done it before and realizing though that sometimes I may get stuck. Eventually, if I keep at it, I'm going to break through a plateau. And once I break through that plateau, I'm just going to be full of confidence and courageous and be really able to move forward because that's exactly what uh, flow does for you. So the method is in finding flow, the method is practice. And that's essentially what it is. You have to practice and you have to have this ability to add an element to it and take an element away until you improve. And what you're seeking to do in improvement, and that becomes such a fixture in everything that you're doing. You are trying to improve in everything. So for today, I want to thank you for those that have turned up. Thank you very much. Um, hopefully we'll have uh, more back uh, tomorrow. Um, I hope that's given you something really to think about. But tomorrow what I intend to do is talk about flow and within the working environment. And the, again, the way that's really helped.
help me. And what I want to remind you about is this, is that uh, if you've not dropped your e email to me as a message, I cannot send you. For everybody that's in within the group, I can send you uh, a free copy of Fair Steps to Flow, which is an ebook. But you can also take a VIP membership out, and that's something that you wanted to do. And these recorded sessions will be sent to you so you can remember the sessions and the discussions that we've had together. And you can then perhaps take more notes and really think about what it was that I was trying to explain to you. And also, uh, I will then send you a hard copy of Find Your Flow, Take the Path of Mastery that explains the flow learning cycle in far greater detail uh, than I will be able to tomorrow. So that's all I intend to do tomorrow. Go through the flow learning cycle. If you want VIP, have a little think about it because you get those additional benefits. And on the Friday, the final Friday, we will um, we will have a Q&A session, but that's only for people that have decided to take the VIP. So thank you very much for attending and uh, I look forward to seeing you at the same time tomorrow evening. Have, have, have a great evening. Thank you so much.